in amazement as the drama unfolded. It was a horrible insight into a, what looked like a, a totally dysfunctional marriage and a dysfunctional family. All made possible because of a desperate decision by a desperate princess. If Diana had been living in medieval times, she would have had her head chopped off. Every step of the way was shrouded in secrecy and subterfuge. If one had done what Diana had wanted, she would have been found out instantly. Diana entrusted her entire future to a journalist she hardly knew. At that moment, she was gambling her life on me. In 1992, jobbing journalist Andrew Morton was propelled into the world's spotlight by the publication of his sensational book, Diana, Her True Story. But it was a story Britain did not want to hear, and many took out their anger on the messenger. Andrew had the worst press of any author in the history of the written word. Now, two decades after first publication, those involved tell the full story of how this book came to be published. Pre-Morton, you tended to believe what the palace were telling you. Post-Morton, everything was up to question. The royal family. For centuries, the embodiment of national pride, identity, and unity. On the outskirts of London, in the archive of author Andrew Morton, is evidence of a scandal that nearly destroyed them. These are some of the tapes, Diana. There's a tape here about Camilla Parker Bowles. The contents of these tapes are well known, but the full story behind Morton's incredible scoop that nearly brought down the House of Windsor all began in the 1980s, when he was working for a minor tabloid, the Daily Star, as a royal reporter. Breaking stories on the royals was always a difficult task for journalists. Coverage had been the same for decades. Every member of the royal family was treated with respect, and royal reporters didn't speak until spoken to. But the new princess, Diana, young and modern, started breaking down those barriers. Diana flirted constantly with various individuals in the media. She knew all of them, the regulars, by name. And she would seek certain ones out. One of the reporters who caught Diana's eye was the young Andrew Morton. In Italy, one day, Diana straightened Andrew's tie. And Andrew was a blusher, and he blushed a deep crimson while everybody looked on all agog at. Morton and the Royal Rat Pack followed Diana and Charles around the world. And it tended to be the lighter side of royal life that was reported. This was because the one overriding concern of every royal reporter was don't upset the palace. The palace was powerful enough in those days, and it was well uh, rumoured that if they wanted to, they could get editors to sack royal correspondents they didn't particularly like. Access is essential. Every journalist tries to talk directly to the source. But for royal reporters, that just wasn't an option. The journalists following the royal family can't actually talk to their subjects. You, you can't go up to the Prince of Wales or, or the Queen and interview them and ask them things. The royal family saw themselves as the firm, and every member said the same thing. You towed the party line, and what you talked about was the good works you were doing, the travels you were doing, the overseas visits you were doing, and nothing else. You didn't talk about personal feelings. It's a shadowy world, being a royal correspondent. You do deal with the press secretaries, the official channels. If you haven't got a checkbook, then the only other avenue of contact for you, in my case, were ladies-in-waiting, the occasional friends of friends, but it was a difficult world in which to establish any true journalistic contacts. Every royal engagement was a chance to widen the network of contacts, and Morton pushed himself further than most. So the job of the royal reporter was always to look behind the theater, to go behind the scenes, to get into the dressing room, to see the royals, as it were, without their makeup on. On the 15th of October 1986, covering a royal visit to St. Thomas's Hospital in central London, Morton met someone who would change his life forever. Diana was opening a scanner 
and she was shown around by a guy called Dr. James Colthurst. It was clear that he was more than just a doctor, he was a good friend of hers. The radiologist was a long-time member of Diana's social circle. They'd met as teenagers on a skiing holiday. And Morton realized this doctor could be a contact worth cultivating. I invited him out for lunch in the time-honored way. We started playing squash together, and we developed something of a friendship. Over the next five years, the doctor gave Morton lots of help as he developed his career as an author specializing in the monarchy. James had helped me with this kind of frothy lifestyle book called Diana's Diary. And actually, Diana liked that book. In early 1991, as Morton researched his next book on the monarchy, a rumor began circulating around newspaper offices. There was this drumbeat of stories about real friction within the, the royal marriage between Charles and Diana, and it was getting hard to ignore. But no one would go on the record to confirm these rumors, so this story remained virtually unreported. What I didn't know at the time was that uh, uh, the War of the Wales was, was becoming quite intense. Diana felt that Prince Charles was living a separate life with his mistress, Camilla Parker Bowles. She was the mistress of Highgrove. Diana spent her days alone at Kensington Palace. She felt that Prince Charles had his own camp, who would always say Camilla and Charles are just good friends, and to think any more is just outrageous and a nonsense. And she was dismissed as mad. So she was living in this Kafkaesque world where she could see the truth and everybody was denying the truth. Then a series of articles were published that criticized the princess. Diana thought these may have been fed to the press by supporters of Charles. She saw it as a huge injustice against herself and she just felt kind of out of control. Using Dr. James Colthurst as an intermediary, Diana made Morton an offer. Would Andrew like an interview? And, you know, <laughs> of course the answer was yes. And, and that's how the process started. With that simple question, Morton had just been offered one of the greatest royal exclusives ever. But with the palace ever watchful, how could he interview the princess? It was quite obvious that if Diana was going to speak openly, she, there was no point in me trying to see her because I was well known to people at the palace. Um, and so the only way to do it would be for James to go to Kensington Palace and ask questions that I earlier prepared. Morton hoped that if he could get an honest and personal account of Diana's life, it might enable him to write the inside story of the Waleses. What he actually got was more than he could ever have hoped for. James called me one Saturday and said, uh, I'm in Rislip, I'm doing a, a medical course, come and meet me. And we found ourselves sitting in this working man's cafe. And we had a bit of small talk, he ordered, ordered a cup of tea. James took the tape out and I put on the headphones and started listening to Diana talking. How do I describe this? It was like it was a prisoner who had not been allowed to speak to anybody for 20 years. And she, she was spoken a torrent. The words just tumbled out as though she had to get the message out before the guards came. And that was the feeling that I got from, the, from listening to her talking about this woman, Camilla Parker Bowles, about suicide attempts um, and about this eating disorder. I was shocked. I mean, here I was. I was a guy who'd spent the last few years of my life following her around, and I had no clue about any of this. I wasn't allowed to touch the tape uh, other than just to hear the few minutes that he played me, and off he went. And I walked out of that cafe like I was walking into a parallel universe, that I'd been entrusted with this huge secret why was she cooperating? Giving out her innermost secrets with no guarantees that I wouldn't go to the News of the World the next day or one of the other newspapers. It was an extraordinary act of faith on her part and, in a way, an extraordinary act of desperation. 1991. Andrew Morton, journalist and author, had just learned an incredible secret. 
He'd listened to a tape in which Princess Diana revealed her private misery. This could be the greatest royal scoop ever. But Morton knew this wasn't the stuff of tabloid exposés. It had to be treated sensitively in a serious biography. So Morton took Dr. James Colthurst, the close friend of Diana, who'd made the recording, to meet his publisher. When somebody comes in and says to you, I've got this big thing, the first thing they start talking about is how much cash they want. He didn't want any cash at all. And that was very interesting to me. Uh, it, it just struck me as a, a genuine friend of Diana's who had um, a, a bit of a mission. When James produced his tape of Diana, they took no chances. We moved the staff out and we shut all the doors and he played a fragment of this tape again. I was absolutely flabbergasted and amazed at the passion and uh, the, well, the details of the story, obviously, were, were hair-raising and so surprising. Amara quickly realized Diana couldn't be revealed as the source of this book. Her involvement would have to be kept secret. Mike said, well, this is all very well, but how on earth are we going to prove this? Uh, because obviously it was clear to all of us that if Diana was to become intimately involved in this project, she'd have to have deniability. Diana hadn't, hadn't considered the consequences at all. Uh, she, was, um, she was really reckless. She hadn't thought this through. It was quite clear. If, if one had done what she wanted, she would have been found out instantly. Their fear was if Diana was discovered as the source, the palace would use its power to stop her, and the book would never be published. So Morton and his publisher came up with a plan. Andrew would go out and interview a lot of the very closest friends of Diana and use, use them as Diana's voice. So when we discovered something from Diana, we got other people to say those things. And so the secretive process of interviewing the princess began. I would be writing questions for Diana and James would go along to Kensington Palace, go to her sitting room and she'd come in, lock the door because she didn't want some butler listening in at the keyhole and James would start asking questions and just literally go through the list. For each startling revelation, Morton needed someone to back up the princess. Diana even approached some friends herself, asking them to cooperate, such as old school friend Carolyn Bartholomew. Carolyn Bartholomew agreed only to speak about her school days, and, but she did also speak about Diana's bulimia. As the months went by, the book slowly took shape. On Fleet Street, stories sympathetic to Charles continued to be published. To help Diana redress the imbalance, Morton wrote a series of articles. He did an article for us called Truce, which was an attempt to try and stop the, uh, the briefing and the counter-briefing that was coming from the Charles and Diana camps. I mean, by this time, to my amazement, they had basically formed two camps. In medieval times, it would have been two armies and they would have fought in the middle of Hyde Park or something. Morton's articles weren't based on gossip, but accurate inside information, and it didn't go unnoticed. I think the reason why the royals became slightly troubled by what Andrew was writing was the quality of the information he was getting. He was getting some really interesting uh, news about the workings of the Prince and Princess of Wales's office and, and, and the people around them. This was a new direction he was taking uh, royal reporting. In July um, 1991, there's some notes about the call from Richard Kay. It says, you've got them rattled. Be careful. They're looking because you're getting it right. They're turning the place over very quietly. Someone from the palace, I believe it was one of the private secretaries of the Prince of Wales, had called me up and, and asked me, uh, had I seen Andrew, did I keep in touch with him, and, and, and did I have any idea where his stuff was coming from? And just by that, I knew it meant that they were concerned about it. A few weeks after that, actually, my office above an Indian restaurant was broken into. The door was broken. Files were rifled through, a camera was taken. James always kept the tapes, so it was difficult for anybody to find 
material. But obviously, you know, there was bits and pieces written down on notebooks. When Andrew's office was broken into, it was, oh my God, here we go. The feds had broken in, it's Watergate. Who, who did it? I've no clue. But it was a remarkable coincidence. I knew that he was getting a lot of strange phone calls and he was convinced himself that his phones were, were being tapped, um, which seems highly likely under the circumstances. Fear of surveillance wasn't Andrew's only concern. No one was willing to go on the record about Diana's allegation that Prince Charles was having an affair with Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles. Without verification, it would have to be dropped from the book. News of this was relayed to the princess. She was furious, and she was at Balmoral at the time, and she went to Prince Charles's briefcase and found a handful of letters and postcards from Camilla. She gave them to James, he let me have a look at them, and they left me in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this was a relationship that was ongoing. Even that wasn't enough to prove that they had a sexual relationship. So we went to see a top libel lawyer, charged us £3,000 an hour, even in those days. He quite simply said, you can't publish that. He said to me, Mr Morton, who do you think a court's going to believe, you or Prince Charles? I said, well, OK, we know they're having an affair, you know they're having an affair. Uh, we can't say it uh, that way. How can we say it? And uh, then he started earning his money. He said, uh, "If you don't talk about their affair, talk about a secret friendship. That might help you through uh, your difficulties. Armed with these magic words, Morton completed his manuscript. His next step was to send it to Diana for approval. At first, she would delete whole sections. Anything to do with anybody that wasn't her, she would delete. So what we were afraid of was that the message was going to be blunted. There's one piece here that she's deleted that her first thought was of Camilla. She walked down the aisle at St Paul's Cathedral, seeing her in her grey dress and her grey hat. And I said in, in a note to her, these are key pieces of evidence and absolutely crucial to the story. The whole Camilla theme is blunted without this factual evidence. To give her great credit, she recognised the fact that, that what she said had to go in the book and what she knew to be true had to go in the book. And so her alterations are very few and far between. February 1992. Andrew and his publisher knew that the finished book would cause a sensation. To maximise publicity and income, they needed a deal for newspaper serialisation. With an asking price of a quarter of a million pounds, they headed to Wapping and approached the Sunday Times. I turned them down. I said I didn't believe it. I said rather sniffily, this is better off in a tabloid, not in the Sunday Times. And I thought, bloody hell. Honestly, I've got the hardest property in the world. None of these guys want it. Serialization was key to the book's success, so Morton took the initiative. He made a call to a female friend of Diana's who had influence at the Sunday Times. A couple of people, much more establishment types than me, said, you know, Andrew, there could be some truth to this. We've heard things too. People who knew Diana's close friends. So we decided to have a look at it again. So I called Andrew Martin back in to grill him much more, and he stood up to the grilling. So he said, yes, we'll uh, serialise it. Serialisation was a big deal because it gives the seal of authenticity. You've got a big newspaper group behind you, and this book needed some friends. The aim then was to try and keep it as secret as possible because the word was out. Every journalist was desperate to read the book's contents, so a decision was taken to print at a secret location in Finland. Bizarrely, someone managed to find out, and hardly anyone knew about it, but the Finnish printer told me that some guy turned up pretending to be me. And he turned out to be a Fleet Street tabloid journalist, turned up the plant saying, I'd like to go off with a set of page proofs, please. They were obviously incredulous and phoned my office and found me sitting behind my desk. As rumours circulated about the contents of Morton's book, some inside the palace began to question Diana herself. I said to Diana, I want you to look me straight in the eye. What do you know about Andrew Morton's book? 
And she did look me straight in the eye. And she said, I don't know anything. I've heard about it, but I know nothing. Serialization drew nearer, and the enormity of her actions began to dawn on Diana. As we got closer to publication day, she was definitely getting nervy. As D-Day approached, she said to a few people, I think I've done something that's going to change my life. Diana was putting an end to her royal life with this book, whether she fully realized it or not. She was going to have to face a different world. The night before, I remember sitting in the office in Wapping, pouring myself a whiskey, sitting on my own. The, you know, editors are like football managers. When things go well, you're a hero. When it goes badly, you have no friends at all. And I just sat in my office, and I had, a, and I just, and I, I knew that this was make or break. I was really nervous. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like someone who's been over the top in the trenches. I felt exactly that kind of. Uh, feeling that um, I was going to be shot to pieces by um, a fusillade from the from the mass media. The first edition that said Diana driven to five suicide attempts. I have to say I gulped because I thought this is it. This is the the sharp end of it now. I was very concerned whether or not Ritz were going to be flying, whether or not I was going to get a phone call from Andrew Neil saying. I've got two policemen in my office, and they're threatening to put me in prison. Rupert Murdoch called me, and he said to me words to the effect, uh, it's now going to be really difficult for you. They are now going to come for you, no holds barred, and they are not nice people. Sunday, the 7th of June, 1992. The shocking revelations contained in Andrew Morton's book, Diana, A True Story, were published in the Sunday Times, and the world was stunned. The furore when that first edition hit the streets was incredible. Diana, according to the serialization, had tried to commit suicide. What? I said, oh, rubbish, you know, Sunday rubbish. There was a chunk of the press that didn't regard it as a scoop for the bizarre reason that they thought he should never have written it and they didn't want to give him any credit, and of course they didn't want to encourage others to get involved in this sort of thing. Most of our readers just didn't want to find this in their newspapers. It is characteristic of the English middle classes that they know there are lots of nasty things going on out there, but it doesn't mean they want to know about them, that hypocrisy is absolutely fundamental to English middle class life. The public didn't want this to be true. They didn't want Diana to be miserable, unhappy, sad, all those things depressed and bulimic and wanted to kill herself, they still wanted the fairy tale. Some inside the palace who knew what had really been going on in the marriage were angry Diana had broken protocol. My immediate reaction was stupid woman. Um, there, was, there was no other, other thing to say. You know, how stupid can you get? She spoke to me on the morning of the publication and there was panic in her voice when she called me. What do I do? What do I do? And I said, well, you've done it. Uh, there's nothing more you can do except go and pour yourself a stiff scotch and go and get drunk, because there is nothing more to be done. But there was plenty the press could do. Jealous of his scoop or skeptical of its contents, they quickly turned on the messenger. I realized that once the tiger of Fleet Street is unleashed, all you can do is cling to the tail and hope to survive a mauling. I was stupid enough to say publicly um, on the radio and on television when the controversy first broke that I thought the Sunday Times were quite wrong to run this stuff and that it couldn't possibly be true. I could not credit the idea that Diana could have confided in somebody like Andrew Morton. Morton was an ex-royal uh, correspondent. What's more, he'd worked for the Daily Star. And, and, and so they tried to undermine uh, the veracity of, of his stuff um, by suggesting that people like him couldn't know anything. I was a kind of a tabloid oik from Leeds, to quote one critic. And the fact that he was from Leeds meant, of course, that he couldn't be trusted. This is the kind of snobbery we had to deal with in these uh, days. The press criticism intensified. And now, fearful the revelations could damage the monarchy itself, those in authority attempted to discredit everyone associated with the book. It's an odious exhibition of journalists 
dabbling their fingers. It was the establishment red in tooth and claw, really out for blood. The chairman of the Press Complaints Commission talked about dabbling in the stuff of people's souls. I had somebody in the Brigade of Guards who wanted to horsewhip me. You got the Archbishop of Canterbury talking about the effects on the boys. I had politicians who wanted to send me to the Tower of London. Then you get calls at nine o'clock at night from people saying, we understand there are people with blazing torches that are going to burn your house down. What? Death threats were made by an Irish paramilitary organisation of some kind to my publishers and passed on to Scotland Yard, and they took it seriously. It wasn't just Morton who was fearful. The media spotlight was now focused on some of the book's contributors, like Diana's old school friend, Carolyn Bartholomew. Had she betrayed her friend? I can't, I really can't comment on it. If the book and those behind it did not have the princess's blessing, Diana's story was in danger of being lost. The princess needed to do something. She was due to see Carolyn Bartholomew, and she was having serious cold feet about going. And James spoke to her, Carolyn spoke to her, and said, you know, you've got to go. You've got to show support for your friends, because they've stuck their necks out. Diana agreed to the meeting, and Morton decided to play the press at their own game. He phoned all the major newspapers anonymously alerting them to the princess's visit. About seven o'clock at night, Diana turns up, and, and William, uh, Caroline's husband, calls me and says, there are no photographers. Photographers had turned up, but had missed Diana's arrival and left. So Morton phoned an old friend he knew he could trust. I'm at home in Chelsea, and the phone goes, and the voice says, are you able to go to Caroline's house, be there for nine o'clock, and Diana will be leaving at nine? You'll be on your own. Yes, I said. This never, ever to be spoken about. Right. So I go round, I get into the street, walk 50 yards up, camera ready. Nine o'clock, the door opens. I thought, crikey. Out comes Diana first, followed by Caroline and her husband holding the baby. She gave Caroline Bartholomew this enormous hug. Well, you wouldn't do that to someone who had betrayed you. And we took this as a clear visual symbol that Diana was telling the world that actually she had authorized what Caroline Bartholomew had said. Still, we didn't know that Diana had spoken, but if her friends had said it, then and uh, Diana had told them to, then it gave a whole new edge of veracity to, to the book. It wasn't necessarily endorsing. It was just Diana being manipulative when it came to the media. She once told me she was hunted and haunted by the media. But if you caught them uh, on the one hand and rubbish them on the next, well, you can't help but being hounded. If, you, if you're asking for it, then it's going to happen. You can't pick and choose when they're going to do it. Although the photo convinced many the book had Diana's approval, others were still reluctant to believe it. Some of my executives, uh, who were much more savvy and sensible than I was, um, formed up to me, not once, but repeatedly, and they say, Max, you've got to get real. The Morton story is true, that all this is for real, that Princess Diana has confided in this guy. She is unbelievably unhappy. This marriage is cracking up. You have got to start reporting this story. And I hung on and hung on, um, going on digging my hole ever deeper, uh, insisting that this couldn't be true, that uh, Diana couldn't possibly have done this. And, of course, I was absolutely wrong. It was a wake-up call for the establishment because they had to start thinking, well, hang on, this, this isn't just some uh, tabloid tittle-tattle. I want the great British institutions to survive and prosper. I don't want to be involved in bringing them down, and that's the end of town I come from. But that sometimes means, and it did in this case, um, that one failed in really doing one's job as a journalist. Serialisation had generated huge publicity for the book, but surprisingly, some stores refused to stock it, and pre-orders were very low. The book trade was not really treating this book as the blockbuster I knew it was. And the word always was, oh, this is this royal tittle-tattle. It's all in the newspapers. They're not going to buy a book. Who's going to pay £15 for all this? 
I said, everybody. On the 16th of June, 1992, 10 days after serialization began, Morton's book went on sale to the public. My sales reps were telling me, no, the interest isn't there. You know, you've really overcooked this one. 50,000 copies, you're crazy. As it turned out, I'd printed it enough to last one morning. <laughs> I realized it was selling well when people were stealing it and running down the streets of the shop and the booksellers were chasing after them because it had so few stocks. I mean, the book sold out within a matter of hours. The whole world, it seemed, wanted to read what Morton had said. And why not? You know, this was a very, very important marriage um, about to explode, it seemed. Morning to you. Well, the Daily Telegraph thinks he should be hung by the neck very slowly until he dies. The New York Times, apparently, yesterday morning, Andrew Morton, thinks you would have won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, if this, Morton, uh, now a household name, was thrust into the spotlight to defend his book. He was very inexperienced at television in those days and quite nervous. And I remember going to see him about half an hour before the show and he said, how do you think I should be? I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I mean, he said, do you think I should tell a few jokes? I said... Andrew, um, you've got death threats, you've got basically, you know, a long time in the tower, just around the corner, you've got most of Fleet Street up against you, and a lot of the public are up in arms and think you're a liar. Please don't tell any jokes. <laughs> just, just play it straight. Are you hinting that Diana may leave Charles? Because if she's not going to leave him, it really doesn't matter. It's their own private business, isn't it? Well, as Stephen Twigg, one of her councillors, said at the weekend, and he'd seen her on Friday, that she's determined to resolve this, this crisis because otherwise there's going to be a tragedy. And what he meant was that there'll be a tragedy for the House of Windsor, for the monarchy, because what she would, what, what she would leave. What does he mean by that? She, she will go? Yes. He, this, this is the enormity of the problem that we're facing at the moment. Now, in the past... Mentioned... After 18 months of secret research and planning, Morton's book was an international success. It sold two million copies in two months and was translated into 20 languages. But for Diana, a curious thing happened. Royal life seemed to return to normal. The marriage appeared to be still working. They were together, and to all intents and purposes, it looked like she'd been brought back in by the palace and was sort of under their control again. When James Colthurst first asked Diana, what does she want with this book? Does she still want to be with Prince Charles? She said, yes, she did. She wanted him to come back to her. And that conditioned the way he, he responded to me throughout the book. He, he had this ulterior aim. But when the book came out, the situation between Diana and Charles had got so bad, she couldn't bear to be in the same room with him. The thing was that none of us believed that the marriage could possibly go anywhere, but it had, they had to remain married because at the back of our minds was the abdication crisis, and nothing like that's going to happen. But six months after Diana, her true story was released, an announcement was made that would change everything. I wish to inform the House that Buckingham Palace are at this moment issuing the following statement. It had been six months since the release of Andrew Morton's book, the greatest scandal to rock the royals in modern times. And although the Prince and Princess of Wales were trying to carry on as normal, the cracks in their relationship were impossible to hide. It was a total charade, and that charade was exposed during their trip to Seoul in South Korea. The media had made up its mind. They weren't wrong. A lot was open to interpretation. But you see two people standing together, looking in different directions, with a, a gap between them that you could put a, a double-decker bus through, then that speaks volumes. It doesn't need me to say anything. Most people still hoped that this marriage would get through whatever difficulties there were. They kept it on the road for a while, and the royal family tried to dampen things down. But as the year went on, it was clear it was all over. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that, with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses had no plans to divorce, and their constitutional positions are unaffected. It was a big deal. I mean, this is the future king and queen after 10 years of marriage. The fairy tale was ended. There was widespread shock. I mean, we all thought Charles and Diana had used the intervening six months since Morton to actually to sort out a new life together. They would, they would work it out. Her Majesty and His Royal Highness particularly hope that the intrusions into the privacy of the prince and princess 
may now cease. Once it became clear that Don had a true story was her true story, um, the ball game had changed, and uh, people were not taking the palace's word for granted anymore. Because let's face it, they had been spun a story for years that was a pack of lies. I remember having a conversation with one of Prince Charles's press secretaries at the time, and he says, well, of course, we knew all this all along, but we couldn't say anything. I said, well, you were feeding us a lie, then. You were lying to us, in short. Yes, but we had to. I mean, think about the alternative, and I can see their position. But yes, we all thought that um, we'd been conned somewhat. The press no longer took the palace at their word. They were determined to uncover the next big scandal. It was open season on the royals. Royal reporters were on a warning, I suppose, from their editors to go out and get something. So there was a lot of digging going on. We probably were more aggressive in the weeks and months after the Morton book, simply because we felt that there must be more than this. Would you run out of film? <laughs> and with a little digging, um, then maybe we can come up with some more. And sure enough, within a matter of months, two or three months, um, some quite astonishing things came out. Both Diana and Charles were victims of phone tapping. Squidgy Gate revealed Diana's close relationship with James Gilby, and Camilla Gate was a huge embarrassment for Charles. These tapes had been sent to the press years earlier, but were never published for fear of upsetting the palace. Morton's book had opened the floodgates. These tapes had been around. They'd been around since before Morton's book, um, but suddenly, in, the, in that febrile atmosphere, uh, I mean, in the summer of 1992, there suddenly seemed an appetite for anything and everything. After this humiliation in the press, Diana and Charles went on the offensive. Both gave television interviews that were every bit as frank as the revelations first exposed in Morton's book. I said to the Prince of Wales private secretary, you're all bonkers. This is absolute madness for the Prince of Wales to tell all, um, to put his side of it. And the private secretary, Richard Daylard, he said to me, but we've got to do something. And I said, but why? I said, the Queen's done brilliantly by doing absolutely nothing all these years. It was airing dirty washing in public. Unfortunately, being members of the royal family, your washing is already being aired for you without you having done anything about it. But when you start doing something about it, then the lid's got to be put on it. And that's when the Queen stepped in and said, OK, you two, make up your mind. Are you going to stay together or are you going to get divorced? But this can't go on like this, because it's damaging the institution. Four years after publication of Diana, her true story, the future King of England and his would-be Queen were divorced. Diana immediately cut all ties with the palace and tried to resume a normal life. The press kind of backed off. But there's a group called paparazzi who didn't back off. They saw a very fast and lucrative buck to be made, and they pursued her relentlessly. She couldn't move anywhere without a lens within feet of her face. Because she had no protection, she had become a business for freelance photographers. Just like, you know, wolf cubs. Once she ran, they ran with her. Diana told me how she felt hounded by the press, how she didn't use the word hounded, actually, she used the word raped. She felt raped by the press. I got to know Diana, not well, but as well as most newspaper editors of the time did, and um, she was a very sad and lonely figure. Diana's troubled life had been laid bare in the pages of Morton's book. Because of this, the public felt a connection to the princess more than any other royal. With the nation in mourning after her tragic death in 1997, Diana, her true story, started selling in its thousands once more. It didn't feel right, because I kept thinking that now that she's dead, people have to know that this isn't uh, a book that's just really about Diana. This is, this is a book by her. These are her words. So a decision was made to release a new edition of the book. And it was against, and so was James. And I bullied them into it. And I was so wrong, it was a really dumb thing to do. I just f did not fancy going over the top again. 
uh, to face the guns of, of Fleet Street, and I was very reluctant to do it. This re-release revealed Diana's true involvement and included transcripts of her tapes. Although the book sold in huge numbers, there was also further condemnation. I should have seen it coming, this tsunami of uh, outrage and abuse, which hasn't really stopped uh, today. I mean, and from Andrew's point of view, Andrew is a, a famous author, but he took the hit, uh, not so much me. You know, the fact that here's an author who's interviewed a subject, shock. I mean, it was risable, the attacks on me, but that was the way it was at that time. Diana, her true story, and its re-release after her death, bookended a five-year period that rocked the royal family. And it continues to have an effect on the monarchy today. I think that the Morton book was not quite on a par of the abdication crisis, but it wasn't far off. It had a huge impact on the royal family because I think once they recovered from the shock, they realized they had to get their act together. And the slow rebuilding of the royal family's position in British society and the repositioning of the royal family as well, I think started in the aftermath of Andrew Morton's book. Andrew Morton's book was ahead of its time. It was the first book of its kind to talk about not the history of the royal family, what really happened between uh, Edward and Mrs. Simpson, but this was here and now. This, this was a, a snapshot of a, of a collapsing marriage. Um, and inevitably, people found that upsetting, even if they came to accept it. And a lot of people, to this day, I think, wished he hadn't written it. It was one of the few times a book changes history and, and changes what is actually going on at the time. But how will history remember Morton, the much maligned messenger? He was probably one of the best royal journalists ever to do what he did. There's people today who claim they're this, that and the next thing, and again, they're the meringue makers of this world. There's very little substance to anything they say. Whereas Andrew Morton pulled the curtain back and said, look what's going on in here. I'm very proud of Dinah Hurtry's story. I'm glad that the book came out and, in some ways, helped Diana achieve what she always wanted to achieve, which was freedom and a degree of personal happiness. Andrew has had the worst press of any author in the history of the written word, I would say. Um, what, what has Andrew done? He's published biographies of various people that sell rather a lot of copies. People like reading them. He's published the most sensational, most influential.